It is just a huge honor today to be in downtown Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. Cambodia is 15 million people. This is the capital of Phnom Penh, has about 2 million. And this, I am with Dr. Tith Hong Yu. Did I say that right? Dr. Right, Tith yeah, Hong Yu. Your dental office is a 10 story building. That yeah, this is right. the um, largest dental office in Southeast Asia. And um, so it's just a huge honor that you invited me up on the uh, the eighth floor of this de uh, gorgeous dental office. I, I've been taking a tour of it. It's just amazing. Dr. Tith Hong Yu is the head of oral surgery and implantology at Room Cheng Dental Hospital. So that's what he calls this Room Cheng Dental Hospital. And Room Cheng means uh, it's Cambodian for water lily. He's also the hospital's director and founder. He graduated in general dentistry in 1995. 10 years later in 2005, he graduated as doctor of dental science from the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Health Sciences of Cambodia. He was awarded the prestigious certificate in oral implantology in 2003, and in 2015 became a master of science in oral implantology. Both awards were gained from Goth Frankfurt University in Germany. Dr. Tith is the successful pioneer of a one-step approach in autogenous augmentation and implantation using a bone ring technique. This revolutionary technique is used in implant placement and full mouth restorative procedures. It allows numerous surgeries over months, sometimes years, to be done in one appointment. This research was presented in his thesis and will be published later this year in Germany. During 20 years in private practice, Dr. Tith has regularly attended and continues to attend dental training programs, seminars, and conferences all over the world. Internationally recognized as an exceptional dental practitioner, Dr. Tith encourages and monitors the advanced training of all room change dentists. He can speak Khmer and English. It is just a huge honor for you to be on our Thank show today. Yeah. How did you go from a little boy to all this. <laughs> yeah, it is a long way. Yeah, it's a hard working and uh, it's a passion to grow up from a uh, boy during uh, the war time in Cambodia. As many of the people in my generation who are struggling in the Khmer Rouge areas. And yeah, the hard working can bring me for loving to study hard and to work hard. And year by year, we keep uh, moving forward until we can reach to today. Yeah. So what year were you born? I was born in 1990, 1974. Yeah. 1974? Yeah. And when was the, the dark times of the Khmer Rouge? It, it is between 1974 to 1979. Yeah. You, you were born in 74? Yeah, yes, and, during and the beginning of the war. So you were born in 74. Right. And the Khmer Rouge was 74 to 79? Yeah, right. And how many people, um, some people say that they killed 30% of Cambodians. Is that correct? They killed almost 3 million of Cambodians. 3 million yeah. out of how many? Uh, also about 7 million. Out of 7? Yeah. So they almost killed half the country? Yeah, almost. Some uh, intentional kill, some by uh, disease or starvation. Yeah. And what, what were they trying to accomplish? I mean, why, why do you think it happened? What was the Khmer Rouge thinking? I think that the ideology, because of the uh, leadership uh, of the Khmer Rouge, they want to be prominent, and they don't want to have uh, more people to challenge them. So they have to remove all educated people out. Yeah, and in a very short uh, way, you would say, it's less competition. Yeah. So they killed all the dentists like you and me? Yeah, they killed all educated people. If you, wow. you look like you are uh, handsome, you are clean, nice, they think you are officer, you are business or you are diplomat. So you are the first target for them. If you look like a farmer, a poor worker, they don't care. But those educated yeah, with spectacle, that is the most targeting. Yeah, so... So did you lose a lot of members of your family? Yeah, I, I lose my uh, uncle, auntie, other family member. Yeah, but my, my, my sibling all safe during the Khmer Yeah. And what about your mom and dad? My mom and dad also survived after the Khmer But we live in the younger during the Khmer So it's not very, uh, well, how to say, very big uh, killings uh, community. 
until the end of the Khmer Rouge period that uh, they tried to kill my father, but my father escaped to other uh, area and he saved. Yeah. But um, that obviously must have had a very big impact on you. And you, so you, um, do you think that was a, one of the reasons you worked so hard to rebuild and became yeah, so I, successful? Yeah, I think that uh, the hard work is still in my mind for 24 hours a day from the childhood that I wake up in the morning, you don't know where is the breakfast is, yeah, you don't know where is the shower, yeah. If you want to look for toilet, you run out to the backyard looking for some small tree to escape from the eye of other people to use it as a toilet. Yeah, and when you are hungry, you just wait and listen to the bell from the uh, community canteen. That they rang the bell and you run to the canteen and they will give you a small piece of rice, sometimes a small piece of fish together. Yeah, to eat that, that's all. Yeah, so it's a it's a very hard time, and there's no market, no school, yeah, no hospital, yeah. It's a it's zero year we call it. it's a dark and zero year. So we survive from that is like by luck, not by any thing. Yeah, maybe my parents care me, teach me how to make my own hygiene to protect the infection. Yeah, and that's all. So there's no medicine. Yeah, when you get stomach pain, I climb to the gawa tree and take this new leaf and eat, yeah, and it stops too much pain, yeah, or sometimes we get a big diarrhea, yeah, we eat more of kind of the gawa the leaf to improve the digestion and it stops the stomach, yeah, if you feel any like hot temperature, you go to the backyard looking for the ginger, and you take the ginger, you snap it, put it in the hot water and drink. That is medicine. Yeah, and I, I, can, I can find the medicine myself. <laughs> and now I feel like it's a good practicing because sometimes I met friends who get some problem. I just ask them, okay, why don't you drink the ginger? After the ginger, one cup of hot water, they feel better, improve. Yeah. Um. I'm here with three of my boys, and we went to the Genocide Museum. I see. Um, they always say history always repeats itself. Yeah. Do you think something like the Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, do you think that could happen again in Cambodia, way out into the future? Do, do, do you think humans I, can do that again? Uh, I don't think anyone in Cambodia want to go back to that, that time. Yeah, because uh, the influence from the making the Khmer Rouge is by the Cold War's effect. Yeah, it's not by local people alone. Yeah, during the Cold War's, uh, the influence from the West and the, the communists try to make this uh, area to be like either going to pro-communist or either pro-Western. And it makes uh, thinking, philosophy change. And the people, want, one part want to say, oh, I want to be like American. One part say, no, I don't like this fancy. I want to be polite, like a communist. And this one create the war in Cambodia. So this create internal uh, conflict and create the civil war. And civil war in Cambodia lasts very long. It's starting maybe since 1970. Yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, and it end until year 2000. So it takes 30 years. Yeah. It started in 1970? Yeah. And went to 2000? Yeah, and the 2000. And that is the period of no fighting, yeah. No writing? No fighting. No fighting? Yeah. So do, do, do countries like Cambodia, Laos, um, Bangkok, um, I mean uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, do they feel like they have to lean towards either communist China or the democratic United States? Do they, do they feel in the middle or do they feel they can be alone and independent? Uh, I think the, the, the influence of this uh, balancing is causing from colonization. Like in, in Malaysia, Singapore, yeah, they already sub, uh, like coming out from British. So their philosophy, their feeling is already close to the Western. 
Yeah, so Africa, because they were colonized, yeah, colonized, Singapore and Malaysia were colonized by, by Great British, Britain. Yeah, Great Britain. And then Vietnam was colonized, colonized by the French. By France, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos, colonized by France. So we have a uh, part influence between the Western and between the communist. Yeah. So who was who was uh, who was it better to be colonized by, the French and Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia? Or the British in uh, Hong Kong and Malaysia in, and in, Singapore. In easy conclusion, we can see that those countries who colonized by France, yeah, when they leave back, they they are struggling in war. Yeah, they they're in war. Yeah, they don't have any support to set up like uh, healthcare systems, education system, and. Uh, uh, what to say, like a, a, a legal system, yeah. This is a problem that can, can keep the... From the French? From the French, yeah. So you think the British colonies were better because they set up a healthcare system yeah. and a legal system? A, a education system too, yeah. So the British was better? Yeah. Interesting. So on your journey, you're a little boy, when did you decide to become a dentist. Do you, do you call it dentist or stomatology? It's dentist. Dentist? Yeah. So when on your journey, did out of nowhere, did you decide you were going to be a dentist? I first, uh, after high school, yeah, I don't have intention to be a dentist. I want to be engineer or architect. But in that time, the, the, the place to, in UST is very limited for, for, for dentist, for, for engineer and architect. So I just apply for different university for entrance exam, and I pass dentistry. So I start dentistry. Yeah. And what year was that? In the year 1990. 1990. Yeah. Here in Phnom Penh. In Phnom Penh. Yeah. Right. And was that at the um, the because the, they have five schools? They have a university. They have a government university, right. a military dental school, and three privates. Uh, in that time, it's only one dental school. And that was the government? Government, yeah. And so would, so how long did it take to become a dentist in those days? I spent five years. Five yeah. years? And it's not fully like, uh, we call doctor of dental science. It it's just like a dental uh, physician, yeah. Dental yeah. physician? Yeah, yeah. So how do you, so that was, in, so you graduated in 1995? Yeah, 1995, yeah. And this is just 2017, so that's only 22 years ago. 20 years, yeah. 20. How, how do you go from 1995 to a 10-story building uh, and, and have a dental office with a reputation all over Southeast Asia? Yeah, that is uh, one step that I start to change from early stage. Most of the graduate uh, students during my time, they will go to government work because uh, government also offer that if you want to work for government, you can go to rural area in the countryside to work there for three to four years, and you can move back to the big city. And I was accepted by government to work in my hometown. So I went to my hometown for one, two days, and the head of the referral hospital he just said that uh, if you come here, we don't have a good uh, treatment room for you, but if you have a barber shop, you can set your clinic here under the tree. So I feel like uh, I don't have a very good welcome from the rural uh, officer. And I say that if you think that uh, I'm not very important, can I go back? And he said that okay it's up to you yeah because uh, if you stay we don't have good place for you too so i start to leave from there i went to have uh, my own uh, thinking how to improve in dentistry not only myself but how to transform dentistry in cambodia to a better way so by then i uh, come to the city I start to work with my sister-in-law, who she a very small practice, and I start to travel to neighboring country. First, I went to Vietnam because that time having the visa to other country is not possible. We are in the economic sanction, so it's not possible to have the visa to Western country. Even from here to Singapore, also different country, different block. Yeah. 
So I went to see dentists in Vietnam. I feel like they are better than us because they stopped the war since 1975 and they don't have that uh, like zero years like Cambodia. So their development is, is faster. Yeah. And I learned something from them. And they also start to have uh, private uh, dental supply from Europe, from different companies to Vietnam dentistry. And I also learned about product. And I come back, I buy some equipment. The first equipment I buy is autoclave. I think that to have a good uh, dental practice, the autoclave is important. Yeah, the second uh, equipment that I buy is the oil left compressor from Italy, but it's sold in Vietnam. So I think about how to keep it clean. Yeah, to make a good feeling, you need a clean air. Yeah, not the the, the compressor from the uh, factory from the industry. So I, I start for by that. Yeah, we buy the good suction system to make sure that the workflow is good. Yeah, little by little, every time we buy new equipment, the patients see that we keep improving, more patient support. Yeah, all the income from the patient we reinvest into the material and equipment, and also I reinvest into myself for education. Yeah, after a few years in Vietnam, I found that the dentistry in Vietnam is not to the high end. They are limited. So I moved out from Vietnam. I visit uh, Singapore University for one time. I find that they are very strong. Yeah, and I went to visit Malaysia. I met some friends. And I learned something from them. I, I have one good friend, Mr. Richard Tai. He's a very good one of the early uh, dental technician ceramics in Malaysia. He spent a lot of time overseas for training. So yeah, he introduced me to some of the dentists in Malaysia. So I met, yeah, I met one of the good dentists, Dr. Sim Tang Eng. He is a very early uh, dentist who started implant in Malaysia. And he also very successful in that time. But unfortunately, in the year 2012, he get heart attack and passed away. Yeah, but it's, it's a good point for me to meet all those friends. And I keep say, saying to them that they are very good people. They give me the idea and clue. Yeah, even they don't give me cash or they don't understand what I want to grow. But at least I can understand what they, they, they have, what they show me, and they also introduce me to other people. And by then, uh, in the year uh, 1998, I have the chance to went to University of Malaya for uh, private clinical attachment. I met many professors there. I learned part by them. And in the year 2001, I joined the training program for implant with Malaysian uh, dentist team. To Frankfurt, so I start my implantology in the year 2001. Yeah. So you studied in, you come out of dental school in Cambodia. Yeah. And you studied in Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, right. Germany. Yeah. Five countries. Yeah. I mean, you 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 uh, you're the Marco Polo of dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think you went to more countries than Genghis Khan. But it's not end. Yeah. During my time in. Germany. I also spent uh, two weeks with one of the very early uh, periodontologists. Yeah, his name is Umberto Ba, Professor Umberto Ba. <coughs> and I think now if he's so alive, he may be close to 100 years old. Yeah. So I always call it a, um, you know, if you're going to be an armchair economist, you know, I've lectured in every continent but Antarctica. Um, I think one of the easiest barometers you can tell if a country is growing is what we call the crane factor. Yeah. And you go to many old world countries yeah. and they're not growing. You can't see a crane anywhere. Yeah. And you look around this horizon. I mean, I cannot count the cranes around Cambodia because every crane, um, like, 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 like that building there, how much U.S. dollars do you think that building is going to cost to build that building? I think that for for the the this closest one, yes. maybe it costs about four million. Four million? Yeah. Four million U.S. dollars. U.S. dollar. Yeah. So whenever you see a crane in a city, 
Someone's yeah. made a four million dollar bet on this town. Yeah. And when you go, you you could drive around Italy. Yeah. For a month and never see a crane. I see. Um, but when you come to um, Cambodia, there is uh, or Southeast Asia, there, there's a cr- there's so many cranes you can't count it. And the second thing is um, children. Yeah. Um, you go to some countries that are have um, like like Japan has um, two years economy in in debt. So they, they so their GDP um, two GDPs is yeah. how much debt they have. The United States has one GDP debt. But you, you, you just don't even see babies running around in Japan. But you come to Southeast Asia. We went all the way to Anger Wai Yeah. All you see is cranes and babies running around. Baby running. So yeah. Cambodia is exploding economically. Right. It's just, I believe too. Yeah, it yeah. is just. And, and so is Malaysia. Right. I mean, it's just uh, Southeast Asia. I mean, when, when you see cranes and babies everywhere, that's a growing economy. I have a specific question for you. Um, these um, dental students, is the only way to be a successful dentist in the large metro city like Phnom Penh, the capital, is, could, could a dentist be successful if they were two hours up the river in the rural parts of Cambodia? Can you be successful in rural Cambodia or do you need to be in the big urban metro center? Because of the economic uh, development in the city is very enormous compared to rural areas. So if you practicing high-end dentistry in rural area, it may be very limited patient. Yeah. For high-end dentistry. Yeah, right. But is there money in low-end dentistry? Yeah, there there are some, but not to say like not much. Yeah, my potential. Yeah. So you um you are a pioneer in a specific type of dental implant technique. Yeah. Um, we, we talked about this. Bone um, ring technique. Yeah, w- the bone ring technique. Yeah. Um, t- talk about the bone ring technique. And, 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 I was, and I'm hoping, do you think you would ever grace our, uh, our website? Um, do, do you ever lecture on it, teach on it? Uh, I didn't ever prepare for that. Really? Do, do you have any presentation on that? I haven't. Um, we, w- would you ever consider putting it on Dentaltown or is it a proprietary technique? Uh, I I don't mind to say so far I I used to do some presentation in international conference in Germany yeah and next month uh, there will be the first world uh, bouldering congress that they will gathering all the people who love the bouldering technique in Frankfurt so I will be there for once uh, would you would you mind creating a bone ring technique for us on Dentaltown? Yeah, I need some guy from you how to Yeah, how yeah. To make it. S- send me <laughs> do you have my email? I'm Howard at dentaltown.com. Yeah, yeah I, I So I send from Buden, So yeah. send me an email Howard at Dental There's two Howards, Howard at dentaltown.com and the guy in charge of the online C is Howard Goldstein. Yeah. So he goes by Hogo, H O G O at Dentaltown. Yeah. But I so tell everyone about your bone ring technique. Many uh, many people have never even heard of it. What what is a bone ring technique? Yeah, bone ring technique is a uh, way that we can uh, do uh, bone three-dimensional bone augmentation and uh, implantation at the same time yeah most of the international speaker they have uh, talked like it's no bone no back hole bone no implant yeah but uh, since I I love the implants and I, I find some challenge how to make it fast mostly to satisfy customer who broke a teeth and they want to smile in the next few hours for public appearance. So how to, how to solve this problem? So I keep thinking that only geometric uh, augmentation that is very well adapted can be the most stable solution. So I start to do some uh, bones uh, harvesting using the tram fine and transfer it adapt it to diameter of the implants and the same time I can put a temporary crown. So if the patient comes, they broke the teeth, there's infection, no bone, yeah, we can remove the infected uh, bone and uh, tissues out. We can put the bone ring inside and we do the implant straight away and we can put a temporary crown. So it means that we are super speed. Yeah, conventionally, when the patient comes with infection, 
you will take out the tooth and you wait for four months. After four months, uh, you will uh, start to look how to do bone augmentation, either using the granulate grafting or either using the block grafting. And after that, you have to wait another four to six months and you start to re entry for implantation. And you wait another two to three months, you restart again for re entry for recovery stage. And you wait for 10 days or two weeks and you start to do impression. And after that, you can do the ground. So if you, you start this way, you will do four months for waiting for the primary healing stage. You wait another four months for bone augmentation stage. You wait another two months for the implantation stage. And until you finish, maybe you, you take about 10 to 12 months. Or sometimes you take up to 16 months. Yeah, it's longer, much longer, 16 months, yeah. But with my, my step, I can finish the cases. Yeah, if I don't rush, I can wait for four months. If I rush, I can wait two months, and I can finish in two months. Yeah. Wow. And you, did you invent this? Actually, I beginnings, uh, I'm not the inventor. It was invented by Kishen Hagen, who do it the bone ring technique. Uh, he he's uh, in Frankfurt. Yeah, he do the ring technique, and yeah, he do some lecture. But I never met him. I never heard anything about him. Yeah, so he do his way. Yeah, years later, I did my way, and in year 2003, yeah, I went to Berlin for some uh, biomaterial uh, conference, and I met Kishan Hagen, so he showed his technique. Yeah, he do many stages. Yeah, he do similar to the basic concept, just one shortcut, like when you do extraction, he straight away put the ring, and he start to put the implant and he wait and after that he do the graft, tissue graft again and he can uh, start the prosthesis. So I find that, oh, uh, I also do rings, but I do different approach. And he say, what you do? And I found, I t told him what I do. He say, how can you do that? I say, yes, I do this. And he say, do you see me before what I do? I say, if I, see you before, maybe I never do my way, because I never see what you do before, that's why I do my way. <laughs> and it come to be different challenge. And uh, 2004, I went to Frankfurt for master program, and I talked with professors, I talked with college, and I found that like, my technique is very different from others. Even we use geometric rings uh, concept, but the approach is different, yeah. So Ryan, what do they what do they call that code discovery? I mean, ev when Darwin um, discovered evolution, someone else published a paper on it within that year, and then like the pyramids popped up in uh, Egypt. I mean, all over the world. So it just co. So it's amazing how the forces. Um, so two guys developed a technique independent of each other about the same period of time. Yeah, maybe they are early than me. It yeah, like, but it's in, it's interesting how humans do that. I mean, they kind of co-invent without knowing each other. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there were two yeah, papers on evolution. There were parallel, three. parallel state. Yeah. yeah, but he is in Germany. He more active than me. He set up the core. He go for a lot of training program. Yeah, <clears throat> I was busy during that time. I start the reading technique. I'm, I'm building this hospital, so I'm so busy take care of starting from the. Uh, piling to the t rooftop. <laughs> yes. And I, I seem to be like I cut off from the communication to the outside industry for two years. Well, you, you talked about this stuff. other gentleman. He was in Frankfurt, Germany. Yeah. And you're in Cambodia. Yeah. Uh, Dental Town is about 80, 81% United States and Canada. Also, nice. it, it's 81% is the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Right. So those four countries are 80%. I see. And then the rest of the world is about about 19.5%, almost 20%. Yeah. But I would imagine um, almost everybody listening to you has never heard of the bone ring technique, um, um, especially the United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And I would really, really hope that you um, 
do a presentation on Dentaltown yeah. and show them your uh, amazing technique. That would be, do you think you might do that? Yeah, if uh, I understand how to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, what we do, what we do is, um, every, everybody, we have three hundred and fifty cores. Everybody does it different. Um, some um, upload PowerPoint and then just do a voiceover. Yeah. Uh, some people film an existing presentation and it's a video. Yeah. But there, there's a the hundred ways um, to do it. Some uh, uh, do it over Skype. Um, you know, uh, record. Uh, we could do it a lot of different ways. So let's talk about this office. So, what year did you break ground? This is a ten-story building. Yeah. Did you build the building or did you buy the building? I built the building. You built a ten-story yeah, building. I design and build myself. How how did it? How does a dentist um, able to borrow money to build a skyscraper in downtown Cambodia? Uh, in in that years, uh, I have uh, like a lucky years that I sold one property outside the city, and I got the money to buy the land, this land, and later I sold another pot, two property for a million, so I get the capital to start this uh, construction, and the rest I talk with the bank. Yeah. Nice, nice. And um, so, how many how many um, dental operatories are in this ten story building? How many dentists work here? We have uh, thirty three dentists. Yeah. Thirty three dentists. Yeah, and uh, we have three foreign dentists, two from New Zealand and one from France. Two from Newfoundland. New Zealand. Yeah. Where? From New Zealand. Oh, two from New Zealand. Yeah, and one from France. So the New Zealand, those are called Kiwis? Kiwi, yeah. So you have two Kiwis two from Kiwi New Zealand, and one from France, one from France. and then 33, uh, 30, 31, dentists. 31 dentists from Cambodia? From Cambodia. So 31 from Cambodia, yeah. two from New Zealand, one from France. One from France, yeah. Unbelievable. And how many, um, how many chairs do you have in here? We have uh, 36 chairs. 36 chairs? Yeah. And what? And you call this a dental hospital? Um, what? What are the hours of a dental hospital? Uh, are you open every day? Because uh, when in the in the law of Cambodia, they say that uh, when you have small uh, clinic like one or two chair, they call cabinet. Yeah, it's like a consultation. Yeah, when you have up to ten, they call it a, a clinic. Yeah, but when you have more than ten. It can be a polyclinic or can be a hospital. Okay, so when it's two chairs, it's called a consultory. Yeah, consultory. A con consultory for consultations. Yeah. And when it's three to ten, it's called a clinic. A clinic, right. And when it's over ten, it's called a hospital. A polyclinic. A polyclinic. Yeah, but we are more than 20, so I try to apply as the hospital because we also have a potential to do more work, yeah. And so, are you open? What What are your? Are you open every day, seven yeah, we days a week? Open uh, from in this main hospital. We open from Monday to Saturday, but we have another branch outside this building. We open also on Sunday. Yeah. So, um, what what do you do in this? Do you do everything? Do you do pediatric dentistry, endodontics, periodontics, implantology, orthodontics, do you do everything or is there some things you don't do? Yeah, I do myself. I, now I only do the implants and reconstruction work. Yeah, but my college, we have different specialists. We have two pediatricians who take care of the children. We have six uh, dentists who are doing orthodontic. Yeah, we have uh, one periodontologist. We have two prostodentists. Yeah, and the other are GP. And what is um, what is the um, high end procedures that are selling in a, in Cambodia? Is it mostly implants? Is it orthodontics? Is it cosmetics? What 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 is uh, what what is um, what are you guys doing mostly? Yeah, we we do mostly we do the yeah orthodontic department. They have full of their patient for orthodontic work. Yeah, implants uh, department, we have a lot of implant tests to do it. And also we do the prosodontic, yeah. And the GP, they, they can do restorative, and also they can do crown and bridge, yeah. And do you have the crown and bridge lab in this building, or do you send out the crown and bridge to a lab? We, we have one internal lab who do only the CAT CAM system. 
Yeah. You have your own CAD CAM lab? Yeah, CAD CAM lab. And w which CAD yeah. CAM technology did you go with? Uh, I adapted with uh, E4D. E4D? Yeah. Out of Helsinki, Finland? Yeah, E4D is originated from Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, E four D's in Dallas, Texas, and it was just bought by uh, Plan Mecca. Yeah, they, they bought by Plan Mecca, uh, maybe two thousand and five. Yeah, two years. And ago. And why did you go with E four D? It was introduced by my friend from Malaysia, Mr. Richard Thai, who is a master technician, and he said that okay, please go and join the E four D training, and I found that the concept is convenient, and I, I decided to buy the machine just before the opening of this hospital yeah. so would you so what percent of your crowns are CAD CAM made by E4D it, what what percent of them maybe 80 percent 80 percent yeah and what are the and who makes the other 20 percent mm, uh, other 20 percent uh, we do either sequinium base or the PVM that we send to outside lab our partner lab outside yeah so you have a partner lab? Right. Do you own the partner lab? Yes. And is it in Phnom Penh? In Phnom Penh, yeah. Wow. And how many people work there? About 80 technicians. 80? Right. Is it here in town? Yeah. Oh, my God. Can, can we go see? when when you, you have patients at nine, right? Yeah. Can you tell the Tok Tok to take us to the lab? And yeah, I will ask. Uh, is, it clo is it close by or is it far away? It's not far. It's not far? So, so do you like the lab business? Uh, yeah, it is a, a challenge to make the first uh, modern dental lab in Cambodia in the past uh, 15 years. So I start that lab and after that I joined with my friends and the lab just keep growing up and we get more and more people. in. You Cambodia. are amazing. You are so amazing. I mean, you started the first high tech lab. Yeah. You started the first dental hospital. Yeah. I mean, you are really a blazing pioneer. Thank you. I mean, it is truly amazing. Yeah. So, um, Cambodia, it's still, it, the, the dental schools started dental therapist um, just three months ago, right? Right, right. Um, well, what, what are your thoughts on dental therapist um, entering uh, Cambodia? Actually, there's nothing strange that uh, in U.S. you are doing the dental hygienist. Yeah, so the dental hygienist in U.S., you can let them to do the basic work like cleaning, the polishing, and also a lot of the work to support dentists. But they are always under supervision of the dentist. Yeah, but unfortunately in Cambodia, the dental hygienist here, uh, the government give them the independence right to start their own practice. So they may be a lack of supervision to make sure that they are doing in the right way because the period of education from school is only three years. Is three years? Yeah. And how many years is the dentist? The dentist here, they start at six years. So, so to become a dentist in Cambodia is six years. Right. And to be a dental therapist is three years. It's three years. And what you're saying is that you think that the three-year dental therapist should work under the supervision of a six-year dentist. Right. But by giving them independent practice, yeah. that they, they don't have the proper supervision. Right, right. So you, so you don't agree with this? Uh, I don't say that I don't agree, but I can say that it's not a good uh, solution to give them independent. Yeah. So do you think the... Can it, the Cambodian Dental Association will be able to work with the Ministry of Health to change that? Or do you think it'll be very hard to change? Because the law was uh, passed by and signed by the king. So it becomes uh, a big challenge to uh, amendment this law. Yeah. And what do you, are you a member of the Cambodian Dental Association? I do. The, the, um, the I had dinner with the president of the Cambodian Dental Association. She said there were 430 members and she thought there were 1,200 Cambodian dentists. How many dentists do you think are in Cambodia? Yeah, about 12. 1,200? So 1,200. So do you think if all 1,200 members were members of the Cambodian Dental Association, they would have more uh, money and clout 
to change the dental therapy law? Mm, it takes years to change that, yeah. I, I have not much uh, belief because it was implemented already, yeah, after they approved from parliament and passed to the senate and passed to the king. So the king signed and they put the law into practice. What we are react is after the law is already completed. If we, we know early stage and they start to react at the early stage, it may be can, can change some clot inside that. But right now the government also put like uh, they will limit the work to the, the therapist, not to give full right to do every work. Yeah, they say that if the case is complicated, yeah, the therapist cannot do, you must transfer to the, the dentist. But we don't know how we can limit it because nobody put their eye on them. Yeah, that is a very difficult part. Yeah, and also as you, you see that to be a good dentist, it's not just six years in school. But like for me, after five years in school in that time program, yeah, I spent another 20 years for Kanye education. Yeah. So it takes years and years to come to a skills and reliable yeah, practicing dentist. Well, when you go around the world, whenever you have a, um, what, what the dental associations really are, is a liaison between the practicing dentist and your local government. And when, and when you don't have a strong dental association working with your government, um, the government oftentimes does things that hurts our profession. I've seen it in Brazil, I've seen it in India, I see um, it's slipping away in the United States where membership is, you know, when I got out of school, it seemed like 80% were members. Now it's down to like 65%. Um, the American Medical Association uh, the physicians, it's less than half. But um, so, do you um, do your dent? You have thirty-three dentists. Yeah. Do they do all their cleanings, their own teeth cleanings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they do, do their own cleanings. Yeah, right, right. What What do you um, is um, is orthodontic? I, I a lot of countries um, in the last ten years have seen Invisalign explode. Yeah. I mean, um, they your dentist friends in uh, Singapore um. Invisalign just growing. It's growing as fast as implants. Yeah. Do you see orthodontics taking off in Cambodia like implants? Yeah, the orthodontics uh, also keep growing very well in Cambodia because as you say that everywhere on the street you see the children. Yeah, that is the orthodontic market. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and do you do you think a lot of um dentists will hire dental therapists to do their cleanings. So, you know, like in the United States, um, most of my dentist friends do not do cleanings. Yeah. Um, they hire a dental hygienist or, it sounds like a dental therapist is a dental hygienist right. and an expanded function duty assistant all wrapped up into one. Do you think in the future that you will hire a dental therapist to do the cleanings so that you can be doing crowns and implants and surgeries? Uh, there's some difference between the dental hygienist training in U.S. and the dental therapist training in Cambodia. In, in U.S. you train dental hygienist to be the, like the, the third and fourth arm of dentist. Yeah, you can do like the chest eye assistance and you also train them to be like the one who can do the basic dental hygiene, cleaning, scaling, and some preparation. But the dental therapist training in Cambodia, they teach how to do extraction, they teach how to do filling, they teach how to do simple crown and pre preparation. So the mentality of dental therapists here, they don't feel like they are the chair assistant of the dentist. They feel like they are the dentist. They will be independent, they will do the best in the industry. So the different approach, and it may be difficult for them to come and help the dentist as the dental assistant, because they already put themselves as the, then in the dental uh, job, yeah, duty already. Right. Dentist duty already, yeah. And it'll probably be confusing to the Cambodian people 
of really what is the difference between a dentist and a dental therapist. And they'll probably start blurring the lines thinking it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah, I agree that, but uh, if we are strong, yeah, we know that how to be strong. Yeah, we say that to know the power of the horse, you have to give them a long way to run. Yeah, so uh, at the early stage, yeah, they, we look similar, like they also rule as dentists, we also rule as dentists, but in the long run, they will be different. The patient too, at the beginning, they will look for alternative solution for, to get a lower fee, but maybe one day they, they, they will meet some problem, they're struggling about their uh, dental health problem. They will say, oh, now I know that this is not a qualified dentist. Yeah, we can go to them only some emergency work, but if we need the proper treatment, we should go for qualified dentist. So I don't say that we have to fight against the law, but I s propose and think with my team that we have to fight ourselves to be stronger, to distinguish between the dental therapist and the professional dentist. Yeah. I love that quote. To know the power of the horse, you need to give him a long run, run, and yeah. a long, a lot of a long road. How would you say it? To know the power of the horse. Yeah. To know the power of the horse, you need to give them a long road to run. A long road to run. Yeah. Um, speaking of that long road to run. Yeah. If your dental hospital did one hundred fillings on the posterior teeth, two or three service fillings, and let, let's go with an MOD. On a, on a first molar. Yeah. If your dental hospital did 100 um, fillings on an MOD on a first molar, what percent would be amalgam and what percent would be composite? I am uh, practicing as the uh, mercury free since my early stage. So we don't use amalgam at all in our practice. Yeah. But in to know the power of the horse, you need to give them a long road to run. Right. How long of a run do you think an MOD amalgam would last and how long would a posterior composite last? Uh, that is very controversial uh, ideas like uh, originally we start with amalgam we, I also have some amalgam when I'm a student it's still in the mouth for more than 20 years <laughs> in your yeah, own mouth yeah in yeah. own mouth and uh, we saw the patient with amalgam especially those patients coming from Australia and, and British yeah, they all have amalgam. It lasts very long. We just like uh, another thinking like amalgam can be a toxic, can be irritated. Yeah. Do you think amalgam is toxic to humans? Mm, yeah, if you swallow mercury in certain amount, I will send you to the stupa quickly. Say that again. If you swallow mercury in the certain amount, yeah, I can send you to the stupa. Send me to the what? To Pakoda. Pakoda. <laughs> I missed that. What? what? No. If I swallow a little mercury. Uh, if you swallow enough amount of mercury, I can send you to Pakoda. What is that? You die. Oh, I <laughs> right, right, right. But, um, but, but, but you have amalgam in your mouth. Yeah. So you must not think it's toxic for you. Because you have amalgam in your but, mouth. But this is very. Small I have an amount. amalgam in my mouth. Yeah, it's very small amount. Yeah, it yeah. can be some toxic in certain amount, but we don't know how big it is. And also, it already is uh, like it's setting with the silver powders, so it stay in one location. It maybe get some toxicity a little bit every day into your mouth, but in very minimum amount. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's your dental hospital in Cambodia. Yeah. But what about the 1,200 dentists in Cambodia? What percent of their restorations are amalgam versus composite? For all of Cambodia's 15 million people. I, I have no idea, but most of the young Cambodian dentists, they will go for composite. So yeah. mostly what you see is composite? Yeah, mostly composite. So you see amalgam going away? Yeah. And in your laboratory, um, are you doing any... Um, what If you did 100 crowns yeah. on a first molar... What percent would be gold? What percent would be porcelain fused to metal? What percent would be milled zirconium? Or talk about if you're 
if your lab did a hundred crowns, what yeah. types of percent of each one would it be? Uh, in in this hospital, because we are doing more uh, like uh, metal free work, so it by generation. Yeah, in the early stage, we have no alternative solution. We do PFM, but after that, we start to have gold alloy from a good company. So we start to have a gold ceramic material, and later on, uh, we start with the zirconium frame. But when we see that the chipping ceramic from zirconium frame is a lot, so we give up the ceramic, uh, born to a zirconium frame, and we move to the EMAC. So now in this hospital, maybe 90% of the crown, we are providing the EMAC crown. So, so when you're doing crowns over implants, yeah, also you, use, EMAC. you use EMACs right. from, from Ivoclar yeah. out of uh, Liechtenstein. Yeah. Because the zirconium was chipping? Yeah, zirconium is chipping. Zirconium doesn't chip, but porcelain born to zirconium frame is chipping. So porcelain to zirconium, Porcelain is chipping off zirconium. Right, right. So you're doing porcelain to, so you're just doing Emax. Yes, yes, Emax, full ceramic. Yeah, and now the news uh, papers say that the Emax uh, one millimeter thickness can stand up to 500 MPa. So, so range. porcelain was chipping off of zirconium. Yeah, right. So you went to all Emax. Yeah, we we. we but you them. could do all zirconium. No, not put porcelain on zirconium. You could just do all zirconium. Yeah, now they start the full zirconium crown. Yeah, but we already have the cat cam. We use the Emax. And, and you we, like the Emax? Yeah, we love the Emax because uh, yeah. it's it look nice, look better than zirconium. So we we stay with the Emax. Would would you say um, it seems to me that at least eighty five percent of all the crowns um, are currently are, are Emacs? Would you say that? It, it seems Emacs is the world leader in crowns right now today. I I don't know for outside dentists and internationally. Yeah. But just say what we are using and doing in our hospital, in Rumchong Hospital. Yeah, it seems, it seems like whenever I talk to a lab or seems like any anybody I'm talking to, yeah. Emax is still the leader. But zirconium is definitely making come back. Um, back to your implants. You're a, 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 a major leader in implantology. Um, when you place implants, if you placed a hundred implants, yeah, what percent of the time would you use a surgical guide? Or what percent of the time would you just eye hand do the surgery? I do the surgical guy maybe one or two cases when I was in the training program at the least stage. Yeah, and after that I become a free hands guy. Yeah, brain yeah. guy. We call brain guy. <laughs> Will you call it what? Brain, brain guy. Brain guide? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a surgical guide, he calls it a brain guide. I love that. Um, it seems. I, why do you think it is that whenever I, how many implants do you think you've placed? Maybe 400, over 400 a year. 400 a year? Yeah. So how many do you think you've placed in your whole life? No, oh, maybe four or five thousand. Four or five thousand. Yeah. Why is it that every time I talk to someone who's placed over a thousand or four or five thousand or Carl Misch 20,000, they always do a brain guide. They they just do the surgery. Yeah. But it seems. But but the younger dentist, they think they always have to have a surgical guide. What what? Why do you why do you think there is? Uh, what why is that? It's it's very simple. Either you as a train captain who 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 try on the 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 the, the track, or either you as a Formula One driver who try on this kind of road in the city road <laughs> or uh, yeah doing the surgical guy is uh, similar to you try the train on the track yeah they all straight setting there yeah but unfortunately in the mouth yeah the mothers never put the rail into the bone and the bone always have different uh, condition different step yeah we believe on the the, the cbct that can provide a good uh, morphology of the bone but in the real 
situation, yeah, when you open and you drill, you also have some modification. You need to relocate a little bit or change angulation a little bit. If you do the guy, you are dead. And honestly speaking, yeah, there's some I used to uh, see the presentation in Frankfurt from a true practitioners. Yeah, they do the training, uh, they do the testing with the full surgical guy in uh, Italy, two different center. Yeah, they make planning everything, they put the guy in the mouth, but with the full reconstruction, at the end they give up. Yeah, during the operation, they start, they drill one, two, and the rest they drill by brain guy. Yeah, the other center also has a similar experience. So you can do the guy when there's a good support. Yeah, either you have implants, implant crown support with one guy, one hole for the implant, or either you have natural tooth, natural tooth support and your guy is stable. But when you have full reconstruction from a dentula shore, you may be very difficult to relocate the, the stand. Yeah, and your drilling may be not very accurate. Or either when you put the stand already, yeah, the position that you plan to put the implant at the early stage may be not favorable. Yeah, so you stick back to the brain guy. You still start to relocate it. Yeah. So I, I like don't know. It. I don't oppose with the science, the technology, but uh, this uh, surgical stand and technology was improved in the past five years, and now I don't know how they they grow and develop because I just say that if I do that, I have to spend extra money to pay for this uh, work. And it means like the patient doesn't come to take my skill. The patient will come to take the computer skill to put in their mouth. <laughs> right. Right. So what implant system do you use? There, there must be 175 different implant systems around the world. Um, which one did you go with? I was trained by Professor Nenwing from Frankfurt University. He is the inventor of Angelos implants. Ang Ankylos? Yes. The, which is owned by Densply? Yeah, now it's owned by Densply. Ankylos? Ankylos, yeah. So you still use Ankylos? Right. So how long have you been using Ankylos? 15 years. 15 years? Yeah, 16 years. Do, yeah. do you have any friends at Ankylos? The, the inventor, Professor Nenwing. Yeah. who is inventor of the implant, Anglos implant. Yeah. He is my guru. Um, I wish you'd introduce me to him. I, he's, he lives in Germany? Yeah. Um, I'm, I still um, am surprised that nobody that owns an implant system has put an implant curriculum on Dental Town. I mean, I, if I was the inventor of Anglos or Megagen or Stereos, I would put a 25-hour course on how to diagnose, place, implants, sinus lift. No one's done that on the internet. So uh, uh, there's two million dentists around the world and when they get on YouTube or Dental Town or, their, or Facebook, nobody has done a complete online training, which I imagine would have to take, I mean, you couldn't teach a kid how to place implants in three hours. Right. But um, I, I'm still looking for that um, magical unicorn god. I, you, you could probably do it. You're the Marco Polo. <laughs> you're, you're the Marco Polo of dentistry. Um, you've studied in five countries, but um, somebody needs to do the whole didactic training because there's dental students in you know South America, Asia, Africa that are online trying to see someone walk them through from the beginning to the end of how to place implants yeah. and no one no one's really done that um I see. so you like the ankylo system right and 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 um what about the cbct i i sorry i i promised one hour i'll yeah, i'll it's, end it's quickly okay. we have time um what cbc what cbc three-dimensional cat scan did you go with we are having now is my ray from sephla my ray yeah from Sofala? Yeah. Is that French? Italy. Italy. Yeah. Ryan, can you find that website? C E F L A? Yeah, F L A. And do you think um do you think some 
um, CBCTs are better than others. What, why did you pick the Cephla from Italy? Mm, the, the reason that I pick it because maybe the, the cost is not very expensive. And also I use their dental chairs. I use other uh, equipment from them. They are reliable. The price is not very high and the maintenance is convenient. Not very big problem. Easy to fix the problem and the support team from uh, overseas also very good. And another um, big controversial question with implants is whether you should cement the implant or screw it down. Uh, Wh I, which, do you cement or screw? I always cement. I don't like the screw. Why, why do you not like the screw? Because I feel like the, the patient come for crown, they also get one free filling. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to do a filling for where yeah, the screw yeah, went in. I don't want to give a, uh, the filling for the patient. The patient come for the crown. So I give them a real crown, not a filling. Nice. But a lot of, a lot of people um, say that the... Um, do, you, do you think this is true or false? Some people think the number one reason that implants fail is because of excess cement where they cemented the crown the excess cement gets around the implant and causes peri-implantitis. Uh, it's true that when you do cementation, you don't clean well, you will get uh, peri-implantitis from irritation. Yeah, but it's not true that the cementation crown will have problem to the peri-implantitis. If you do a proper cementation technique, you can remove all the residuals and the crown will last for a lifetime. A lot of implant cements they are not radiopaque, so if there's excess cement, you can't even see it on the x-ray. Do you use a radiopaque yeah. implant cement? Yeah, we use a GIC product. Uh, GIC? Yeah, yeah, the clionomous looting cements, and it's is radio opaque, so we can detach it, we can clean it out. So GIC, is that made by by GC. By GC? Right. Which is out of Japan, but I guess they just moved their headquarter to Switzerland. To Switzerland, yeah. Now, do they move their company to Switzerland, or is that just a, a yes. tax advantage? No, it's just like the, 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 the president, he moved to live in Lausanne, Switzerland. Yeah. So the president of GC moved from Tokyo to, to Switzerland to live? Yeah, to live, yeah. And do you know why he did that? Mm, he's old. He wants to have a very comfortable life. Yeah, Lausanne is a rich uh, community. Maybe it's good for him because he has a billion of money. <laughs> hmm, I don't uh, know because Tokyo is as nice as it gets. Uh, it's I've different. been to Tokyo. Yeah, That's... yeah, you stay in Tokyo, it's nice. Yeah, but once in a while you see the uh, stroke by earthquake, you feel heart attack. Yeah, uh, maybe living in Switzerland is more peaceful. <laughs> uh, I, I, always, I, I wondered if it was for uh, a lower tax rate. I mean, I, I have no idea. I, was just, I have no idea about yeah, that. No but idea. just like he wanted to portion himself as the biggest dental supply company in the world in the year 2020. He wanted to what? The world's largest dental supplier. He wants to be the world's largest dental supplier? Yeah. By 2020? Yeah. And do you think GC will do that? Mm, very hard to say. It would probably take some mergers and acquisitions. He'd probably have to buy some people. Yeah, if, if he can buy, then supply. <laughs> together with GC, it would be enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be a lot easier to buy your way than do that with internal growth. Yeah. Um, but now you see this then supply join with Sirona, so it become a very enormous already. So you, you cement your crowns with um, GC's right. glass onomer. You call right. it GIC? GIC, right. Um, glass ionomer cement. Yeah, right. And um, and you you and it's radio opaque. Radio opaque, right. So you can see the excess. Yeah. So right. my final question, my final question, and thank you so much for your time. Why do implants fail? What 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 are the top three reasons why an implant would fail? The the failure of the implant one is the skill of the dentist. Yeah. The secondary is the material. Yeah, the implant design and implant material itself that is not strong enough. The design is not very stable. Yeah. And the third one of failure is because of prosthesis design. Yeah. 
Well, it's funny because uh, you could say the same about, um, Ryan, let's look at the stat on what percent of airplane crashes are pilot error. So you would, you would say that the number one cause of implant failure is dentist error. Yeah, dentist. Just like when a plane crashes, right? It's pilot error. Pilot error. And when a when a um, implant fails, it's it's dentist error. Yeah. And what do you think those errors are? Mm, your diagnostic. You what? The diagnostic. The diagnosis. Yeah. So the diagnosis is wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. And also the skills when you put inside the bone, you don't have a proper. Uh, tool or you don't have a stable hand to drill it and the socket for implant is larger than the implant diameter yeah you can insert it deeper it gets primary stability but there's a gap between the implants and the uh, bone and during the healing time the soft tissue is growing inside and create the gap so you see the bone loss from early stage yeah that is the human errors yeah what, and do you think there's another error of do you think dentists do too many immediate loads and should um let the implant heal first before placing uh a crown on the tooth yeah actually it's the i i i like to do immediate loading yeah we see the failures is a little bit higher yeah when we we do immediate loading especially with the very limited bones uh, capacity but uh, it worked very well most of the cases what what percent higher failure rates do you see in immediate loading versus non-immediate loading if you do immediate loading with a very uh, limited bone capacity your failure rate can be 25 percent higher rate of failure yeah and and another question they have is uh, smokers. Some people think that um, placing implants in smokers has a higher failure rate. Other people say they don't see that. Um, actually, I believe that for heavy smoker, during the healing period, they can affect to the to the surface of the implant. If you do uh, non submerged healing. Yeah, but if you do submerged healing, it should be the same result with uh, um, similar to the non-smoking patient. Yeah. Do you know what percent of Cambodians smoke? Uh, I think that we are very small percentage of smoker in Cambodia, less than ten percent. Less than ten percent smoke. Right. And what do you think it would be in China? Maybe. I don't know, 80%. <laughs> so, so why do you, why do you, because I agree with you. I mean, the, the joke is in China yeah. that um, they have the, in the restaurant, they have the smoking section yeah. and the chain smoking section. Right. Why, why do you think smoking is so much more common in China than Cambodia? I think that is the culture. Just culture. Right, yeah. Now, the United States, um, in 1950, um, half the adults smoked. Right. And now in uh, 2017, um, it's less than 20%. 20%. It's actually, uh, I think it's down to 18%. So the United States went from 50% down to 18% from a lot of public awareness. Yeah. But, but, some, but I noticed um, in some places, um, um, well, it, it's coming down. Like, like when you go to Europe, like France yeah. and Spain and heavy smoking countries, you, you're starting to see downward pressures on you can't smoke here you can't smoke yeah, there right. control um, yeah. yeah and uh, so do you think they'll start doing that in China uh, in China now they start to have a non-smoking hotel they start to put the ban on the public areas yeah, so yeah. They, they will improve and yeah if they really the government really want to 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 support the uh, non-smoking policy in China, they will be very, very fast, effective, like the drunk and dry in China. In the past, uh, in China, you drink and dry everywhere. But recently, government put a 5,000 penalty when you are drunk. Yeah, so 5,000? Right. 5,000 US dollars? US dollar. In, in um, my, <laughs> where, where I live in Phoenix, Arizona, yeah. it's 10,000 10, US dollars. Yeah, but the, the money drink in the US is bigger than in China. So 5,000 for Chinese is a lot. 
Yeah. Uh, in Cambodia, if we put 5,000 penalty for driving, we are so very effective. <laughs> <laughs> you will sell the house for penalty. Well, it was a uh, it was an absolute honor that you let me and Ryan come by today and podcast interview you. Like I say, I've heard about you in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, you're a legend. I um, you've studied in Cambodia, Vietnam, um, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Germany. You are amazing. Uh, I hope someday you build us a course on Dental Town. But thank you so much for sharing your story okay. you. uh, with all my homies yeah. today on Dental Town. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.